I'm not out of the to come there. Are they going to start it? All right. You have to wear that. You have to wear that. Okay. All right. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Fugo Yuan. Actually, I don't. I cannot introduce him because he's been here long, long time. Right? Quite a long time. Uh, maybe 34 years now. Yeah. 34 That's years about right. On Penn campus. <coughs> so. Uh, a veteran of the department and uh, served in many capacities, but most recently he served as Langley professor, uh, which is basically working with uh, NASA Langley, uh, NC State, and uh, National Institute of Aerospace uh, to build a connection between the three organizations. And he's been doing that for almost 10 years. Uh, uh, and then uh, also uh, in the last semester uh, in the spring, he did a sabbatical where he was at in Prague building some connections on uh, new uh, ways of, of using AI, ML in design, uh, especially in health monitoring, which is which his expertise area is. Dr. Uh, Yuan is very accomplished. He's published a lot. Uh, you just have to go to check out his Google Scholar. He's, uh, he's, uh, he's a well-known person in uh, health monitoring and uh, uh, design methods and, and, uh, and testing. Uh, more importantly, he just received a, a, a Lifetime Achievement Award from SPIE uh, on non-destructive evaluation. So, so a very uh, accomplished person in our department, So, and he's willing to share his knowledge with us. So welcome, Dr. Yuan. OK. <coughs> so <coughs> thank you, Dr. Yika. Um, Let me take one. OK, so look quite technical, right? But later on, you will see that my talk will be very informal. I'm not going to present the results. But I will tell you what I went through in the last six months when I spent my time in Prague. So this is a place I stayed for one semester. You can see Czech Republic. Actually, 30 years ago was they call Czech Slovakia, and then 30 years ago they split into two two countries, right? One on the right hand side, but we are quite close to uh, Ukraine. So back in last year, I did not realize or one of the plan I like to to choose to go to Czech Republic is that you know I can visit Ukraine because um, my grandsons and sisters actually came from that area. But as you know that, you know, the work came, I'm not able to do that. But we had a really good time in the country. Um, now, this is actually a city in the central Europe. And I never visited that part of a uh, world, but this has given me a lot of experience. And uh, if I compare, right, the Czech Republic versus North Carolina, you can see quite similar in color. But if you look at population, almost identical. But in terms of land, right, it's only about two-thirds of North Carolina. And um, they attract a lot of tourists. You can see every year that they attract double of their population. Especially during the summertime, if you visit Prague, you can see all the tourists. People carry all these luggages. You can see tour guide, right, explain all different things. So uh, this is the, all the summer pictures I took from my, when I visited there, it's now coming from the Google images. Uh, most well-known one is uh, Charles Bridge. Um, and then this bridge actually uh, went through the entire uh, the city. And then if you want to visit these countries, I would say 90% of the sightseeing are located right near the Prague. So when you visit there for two, two months, two weeks, you probably, you know, I mean, visit most of the, the, the most significant sightseeing place. Now, this is uh, one of the significant ones. We call the Prague Astronomical Clock. 
This clock built um, installed in 1410, but start to build maybe 20 years before. So the person built this clock, or well, this clock actually is still running. Of course, they give you all this, uh, you know, the daily clock, but also give you the month, the year. And uh, the, the guy designed this clock when, once it was built, he was assassinated because the ruler did not want to have a second one. So that was the reason that, you know, he was killed. And then this is another castle. So if you go to the city, there's so many castles. You probably can buy, purchase a castle, maybe the same price as you built, you, you purchase the, the apartment here. And so they are all, all different castles, I mean, around the city. And there's a one wall quite similar, uh, quite amazing is they call Lenin Wall. I mean, it's, it was the wall that people were trying to fight communists back then. So when John Lennon was assassinated, they pinned his uh, pictures on the wall. And then next day, the communist people, they just pinned it over. And then after one day, you know, and then during the night, I mean, all the residents went back there, repainted again. So this become a place that very, very close to Charles Bridge and become a kind of historical uh, 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 place even it started out uh, from 1980s, late. Now, we do have the campus in Prague. Actually, this building was so close to the astronomical clock. And every year we have a um, group of students, mainly from school of design, so they spend one semester there. <clears throat> and because of these, um, the living expense is so inexpensive. It's about one third of the price in, in US. So if you pay the price living there, it's about the same cost you spend one semester in, in Raleigh. All right, so I think this is uh, it for, before I get into the talk. Okay, before going to sightseeing, so this is the place. I mean, the beer is just very, very famous. Actually, some of the restaurants, you, know, you can get the beer even cheaper than the water. So the first day I went there, some people say, well, what kind of brand? Do you want to have a Budweiser, right? I said, Budweiser, I mean, this is for US. Turned out that this is a mayor from, from Czech. It was a lawsuit between Czech and the US. And then, so the final verdict was that, uh, you know, US, you can still use Budweiser brand, but uh, Czech still have that, that brand too. But of course, it tastes very different. So, all right. <clears throat> So before I went there, uh, I had no idea what I want to do. And um, so this group from uh, Czech Technical uh, University, uh, actually walking distance from we called Old Town near the Charles Bridge, um, he said, well, just come have a fun, right? So I went, before I went there, I checked their website. So this group was working on kind of high velocity impact problems. So this is all I knew. And then incidentally, there was an announcement uh, between US and uh, Czech Republic about collaborative research. So under that framework, they all focus on three areas. Right? One is nanotechnology, machine learning, and the plasma. So I never deal with nanotechnology plasma. So only possibility is that I can put the machine learning you know, I mean, into, this, uh, into this project. So, I spent there for, um, as I said, one semester. So I built a collaboration between our group and also the one from uh, Czech Republic. This is a very unique department. Uh, they have about small department. Uh, they have about 10 faculties. All the faculty members are students of the departmental head. So this probably never happened in the US. <clears throat> So this is the proposal I come up with. As I said, I'm not going to present any result. I don't have any result. I'm going to just propose the proposal I submitted to NSF uh, uh, two months ago. So those are kind of ideas. I mean, I came up with, uh, with, with this group from CTU. So uh, this proposal has uh, three components, of course. 
simulation, we use the Dyna, right? The dynamic modeling, especially to deal with high velocity impact. And then experimental verification validation, of course, right? To validate the results, right, from simulation. Also, we have a very significant cost associated with additive manufacturing. The main reason was this company called Prusa Research. I guess uh, most of some of them you may have that you know at home. Certainly, I have a couple of them. So this uh, this company actually just located right in Prague, and uh, I put this all three level uh, effort together by this called the deep learning. So I'm going to talk about a little bit idea on that, and the purpose okay, on the experimental side. By the way, they have the X-ray, and they also have this called DVC, called digital volume correlation. So that they can really see the strength distribution inside of the materials, inside of the structures during dynamic loadings. Usually when you use a DIC, you only can capture the surface displacement, but DVC can do kind of through the thickness. Okay. I'm going to focus on this called performance aware uh, uh, generative uh, design using the machine learning. The purpose of doing that is trying to provide your materials which can provide you much better, uh, what we'll call the impact strength, right? We'll call, usually we'll have a term called specific uh, energy absorption capability. All right, so the outline of the talk, first of all, I'll talk about the challenges we have so far, right, to design for the such material. And uh, second of all, we're going to introduce the very unique material called acetic. So this material, you can see that the points ratio is negative. So you don't really see those material in nature, but you was, we're going to design in the microstructure such that your effective points ratio is going to be negative, right? And then because of that, it come up with a very, very nice properties. And then we'll talk about, brief about um, the idea we have, right? So in this space, now we talk about capability in this uh, CTU in Prague, and then we talk about our design approaches. Okay. All right. So when we design the material composites, usually we design this for stiffness. Right. We call the stiffness-driven uh, design, but most of them we don't really look into the strengths. The reason later on you will see that. These two properties, stiffness, strengths, are mutual exclusive. If you want to have a strength then your stiffness will not be that, you know, that high. So our question, our ambitious here is that we like to have a three of them together. Not only the stiffness, strength, also energy absorption, right? We're going to design the material which can go, can do both three being high. All right, so this is a common uh, curve we call the banana curve. Mathematically, we call this is more like hyperbolic curve, meaning that if you have a vertical axis parameters, if you wanted to have the higher values on the other end, your margin is going to be low. So in other words, banana curve tells you that there's a trade-off right, between your strength. Right? This is a fracture toughness versus stiffness. Right? So if you want the high stiffness, unfortunately, your strength cannot be high. And then, so this is, as I said, followed by this banana curve right, in this blue one. But what we want to do is that, is it possible we can design materials such that we can have a stronger, but also high strength too. Okay. And that evidence, that's evident by also a tremendous study shown in this curve. Again, you can see that there's a banana curve here indicating that you have a trade-off between your strength and your toughness. So as I said that, we wanted to do both. We want to go you know, in this direction rather than going like a banana curve uh, trend. OK, so now I'm going to introduce this material. We're going to design the material such that uh, the mu, right, points in rate less than zero. So there are some study already showing the points of effect. For example, if you design the material in this type of pattern, when you pull it, Vertically, you're going to see expansion right, on both studies. So conversely, if you compress it, and then transversely going to shrink. Okay. So what's good about it, right? The first one is that you can see from this picture here, 
if you pull any structure, right, you bend one the structure on one direction, another direction actually going to form a called the saddle point due to the regular points of ratio being greater than zero. However, if you design the mu less than zero, you can see that when you bend one direction, another also bend it the same way, concave. Right? Because of this phenomenon, I mean, this material, right? If you can bend one direction, you can kind of make design, make structure more conformable to any curved structures. Right? So that's one aspect people want to use these properties right, for the design. A second one is something that we're looking into. It. As I mentioned that when you apply the compression, right, there's a trend with the going to kind of squeeze in, right? So if you look, the, uh, there's a ball, right? Impact on a structures. If the points ratio, right, is, is greater than zero, you can see the material, right? Your deformation is going to pull the material apart, right? However, if you look in the acetic material, when you impact them, points of ratio, right, getting start to shrink, meaning that your material start to accumulate it underneath of impact site, right? So intuitively, that if you can design material in this way here, your impact resistance is supposed to be higher in theory, right? So how are you going to get this material, right, behave like that, right? Now, this is the one that we're going to envision later on, right, the kind of 3D structures, now, and then there are already several applications for these four shoes, right? Either for shoes, uh, then they can design a special pattern, right? And then certainly when you compress, when you walk, right? And all the material, right, get into the areas, so provide, provide them much more comfort. Same thing, right, for, same thing for this uh, material for the stand here, too. If you can make this small material in not very special geometries, Right? When you pull, when you increase the temperatures, you also expand it in all three directions, right? Rather than you expand in this direction, this was going to shrink. Now, and then people looking at oh, this is another application I mentioned that because they, they give you all the concrete, uh, uh, the, the shape, so that, that people use this material for your helmet. Now, this is one called the bandage, right? So they call kind of smart bandage, meaning that if you, if you are, a place getting swollen, right? So you're trying to expand. So your bandage going to expand in all three directions, right? So your medicine can easy to get in, right? Make sense, right? And conversely, right? If you not, well, if you are now, uh, like in this case here, right? I mean, as I said, it's wounded, right? If not, then uh, you start to shrink. So all the, all start, all the areas start to shrink so that you stop. Right, the medicine come into, into your skin. So those are the ones people has been kind of used that explore that, right, in certain uh, commercial applications. This is something we have, we want to do. So you can see that if we can design the material, right, underneath of those vehicles, right, and then when you have any IEDS, so all the impact coming in, right, and then your material start to concentrate it right near the website, Near that impact site, right? So hopefully that, that enhance a much higher what we call the impact resistance. And also as a result that you are what we call the specific uh, energy absorption will be greater. All right, so this is a um, simulation, I believe, uh, for impact of a two classes of material. One is acetic, meaning that mu less than zero with a special uh, microstructures versus the regular one, right? We'll called the unacetic or kind of regular honeycomb structures. So under the impact loading at a different time, right? So as time increases, you can see that damage. You compare this two versus acetic versus unacetic. You can see that for unacetic, right? Your damage zone, right? Start to propagating, right? Out. However, for the acetic material, you are your damage actually is quite concentrated. So that just demonstrates that in theory, that if you can design a very special acetic material so that your impact resistance will be greater. Right? Okay. All right, so how we're going to design the materials. So we realize that this is usually we, we design, right, from material science all the way to the structures, right, we made. 
However, there's a one we call the material property design space, which is sitting kind of in between in the order of the micron to millimeter. If we can manipulate the microstructures right in this domain here, and we can somehow you can generate a very, very un, uh, unusual property. So this is something that we're trying to design in this space here, right? So provide a better uh, impact resistance. And then fortunately, in the last 20 years, uh, we can make such uh, microstructures through additive manufacturing. Okay. All right. So there are some ideas wanted to pursue that. You can see vertical axis is the SEA, right? Specific energy absorption capabilities, densities, aluminum, right? I mean, they see in this a yellow one here. So aluminum honeycomb has been invented for 50 years. And so far, all advances still steady in this pink region. Meaning that we have not really developed potential, right? For this material being the point solution being negative. So we're hoping that we can push the envelope into this region so that the density right, can be lower, right, lighter. Also, the SEA will be greater. Okay. But not only that, not only the SEA, right, also we want to see that we can also maintain quite sufficient stiffness, also strength as well. Right? So it's not going to be mutual exclusive. If we can design material in this domain, there's a possibility that we can have all three good properties. Okay, so look, look into the microstructures. Uh, you can see on the left side here is a regular honeycomb, right? Now, in the middle, right, there's something being different. You can see that it has kind of similar one, but the shape more like a bow tie, okay? And if you look, the, there are some analytical studies showing that by changing from the regular honeycomb into this, uh, we'll call the reentrant osmotic cell, because we can kind of predict the points of ratio being negative by changing your angle. So this angle, actually, you can see positive, and you kind of push that down into negative. So this is what we call the re-entering uh, um, the, the cells. And then um, the difference, difference between the regular one versus the one we have trying to design is that for this, the uh, materials become highly anisotropic. Also, there's some other properties, but the good thing is that you can, you can tailor your points of ratio with respect to your, your angle over here. Okay? So that's one type of uh, the major re-entrant uh, the cell. And there are other types, right? So there's a Kairos, right? and then this one here can combine the Kairos, also the, um, the re-entrant corners. Okay? This is only just for 2Ds. Now, in reality, right, so this is 2D pictures, but this is something that we hope we want to design. So this getting a little bit more overwhelmed, right? There are so many design parameters you can choose from, right? And at least we have two structures that re entering also the Kyra structures. So the question here is that how we're going to optimize the design, right, in the 3D structures to give us the three performers design, right? Three, the like stiffness strengths, also the SEAs. Okay, capability in Czech um, technical universities. They actually have uh, pretty decent uh, experimental, experimental facilities. This group actually came from uh, kind of biomedical applications. So they use the X-ray to look into the rat vertebrae. Okay, so those are the ones they want to see if there's any damages inside. And then, of course, they have this called DVC, digital volume correlation, so they can look through the thickness of the string. Okay. So they've been doing that for many, many years. And then, of course, they have this uh, kind of cameras try to look into the outer plane implant displacements. And recently, they start to move into the uh, we we'll call the osmotic materials, <clears throat> but mainly in metals. So they design a new, uh, they have x-ray, but also they design this called open uh, the impact hammer. Uh, also, they can provide, they can get the properties uh, with impact velocity up to hundreds of milliseconds, which is much higher than uh, usually we we'll call the low velocity impact. 
And um, they also design, oh, by the design, so that when they capture the forces, so before regular, the Hobson bar, you can provide a very oscillatory uh, the loading, but through their modified design, they can really see the very, very detailed uh, impact forces in much higher uh, accuracy. They also did the uh, final element experimental study versus like a points and ratio, right? Less than, than the strain. You can see that you start with a negative as you increase your strain into much higher magnitude, all the cells start to kind of uh, contact each other. So then the points ratio decreases into zero. Also in, in this one here, they also did uh, both. You can see that uh, once you reach to the, there's a force versus displacement. You can see that they have a very, very high, large volume of energy absorption, right? So you can see this area, right? This area underneath the both curve are the areas that, that this material can absorb. So they do have some base there, and then, uh, but they deal with, uh, they basically select a, a cell, right? And then they made it, and then they test it. Right? And we wanted to see if we can optimize the design such that this area can be greater, right? And this difference also can be greater too. Okay. So regarding about the design, regular in, usually, right? Usually you pick up the topology, right? Geometry, and then you do the test, right? And then you observe the experimental uh, internally, externally, and this is usually we do, right? So uh, in here, you need to have certain uh, prior energy knowledge, right? Some physics intuitions and try air, right? Since there's so many geometrical parameters, it's very, very hard to come up with a, a good design. So then uh, when you look into the other way, we call the inverse design or people call design topology optimization. This actually is a one area, right? So if you wanted to have certain desired properties, you want to have some geometry, I mean, I told you with that. So this area start from nine, uh, 19, late 1980s, and now you have a lot of com com commercial software that can deal with such problems. But still, you have some problem. First of all, this is deterministic approach, right? They give you one design uh, parameters. And second of all, uh, your design can be biased, depending on, of course, when this nonlinear problem, something depends on your initial guess. And the very time consuming, and usually when you do the optimization, you only can just focus on one single parameters. As I said, that for this proposal, we're trying to do kind of three parameters at the same time. Okay, so it seems to me quite hopeless, hopeless to deal with such a giant design space. So we see if we can use machine learning to do the job, okay? So what is machine learning? I'm gonna have a two slides showing the basic of the machine learning. Machine learning basically is nothing but to map an input to output, okay? And then in between, right, you have a lot of nodes, right, or called matches, um, trying to provide the mapping, right? So, and then you can do from X, I call the input to Y or Y to the X, right? Either way, right? But the key is that you need to provide a good mapping, right? This showing this a green one here, okay? So involve many, many, right? It can be a many uh, hidden layers. Each layer, you may have a different neurons, right? Or called nodes, okay? Now, and the, uh, Idea here is that we're trying to emulate, right? I mean, how the brain functions. So by learning things before, and then you can decide things almost instantaneously. So there is a, a paper back in 89. Theoretically, it showed that if you have such a network, network even with a single, right, single uh, green uh, layers, and mathematically, you can prove that by putting those uh, internal, the, the intermediate one here, you always can find the solution between X and Y or, by, or vice versa. So because of those uh, very, very rigorous uh, foundation, now since the machine learning become more, uh, very, very popular nowadays uh, because of other needs as well. So our idea is not just look into this uh, traditional neural nets because uh, people think that this will be just like 
uh, mapping between input and output. But when we train these uh, variables, there's certain constraint behind it, right? Such as uh, when we're dealing with some mechanics problem, a mechanical problem, you always satisfy what? The conservation law, right? Satisfy uh, Newton's law and then et cetera, right? So we wanted to put those knowledge into your training. So this type of training we'll call the physics informed training. So you put all the physics law into the training so that most of the time you don't really need have a lot of uh, training data because uh, your de uh, the admissible design space become much smaller because you constrain all the variables to satisfy such uh, our physical constraints. So this is what we do uh, for this proposal. So um, this is the one type of uh, deep neural net. It was invented, I would say, less than 10 years ago by a group from University of Toronto. This is a kind of deep learning part. It's part of this called unsupervised learning, meaning that you don't have a learning data from the beginning. So uh, to be brief, so it consists of uh, two parts. One called encoder, one is decoder. The purpose of this machine learning is that we want to open up the design space, right? Those are the meaningful or the miserable design space that we can use that for our design optimization. Okay. <clears throat> now, I will not go through the detail, and for this the deep learning, this uh, VAE now, They've been used that for um, the drug discovery, also some of the COVID uh, uh, study too. Now we're going to use this, trying to, as I said, to try to design, trying to open up the design space by looking into this uh, latent space. Okay. If you're interested, in it, we can talk about it a little bit more. Now, so the knowledge gap so far. Right? So first of all, we don't really have any integrated design framework trying to do the performance. When I say performance, it means that there's three things, right? Stiffness, strength, also the energy absorption. And the current inverse problem I mentioned that using up the, uh, the topology uh, optimization is a very biased, very, very time consuming, also insufficient, especially dealing with very, very large uh, the, the parameters. And then we don't really have a complete understanding about the physics inside. That's where the, the, my collaborator can come into play because he has, uh, they have this facility to look into the inside of strain values during the impact. And then there's no experimental facility uh, can look into the internal one here. As I said, that this can be done by DVC. Also, uh, we're trying to use uh, polymeric materials because the PUSA research, their product is related to the polymers. So we'll work with them right, to build this called polymeric acetic honeycombs. All right, so this is a deep test. Um, the first one is the core, deep energy, 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 uh, generated design. We use a deep learning to do that. Modern fabrications, also the last one, of course, of verification, also validation. All right, so let me quickly go through, because this is a, still in the process because it has been submitted to, uh, for funding. So I'm going to just talk about briefly about the text one. Uh, we'll talk about physics uh, machine learning, physics information learning. There are two aspects. One is that we're going to have architecture which is associated with the physics. Second one is the constraint, right, due to the physics. So that can be expressed in terms of uh, the Original, right, we talk about VAE, right? variational encoders. We have this green part, also the, uh, the orange part, I believe, right? This is the regular VAE. Now, on top of that, we're going to add another module, right? This module relates your architecture, three them actually into your mechanical property on top of that. In addition, during the training, we add the physics constraint, right? Mu less than zero into the training process. So we put the two elements in there trying to enforce, enhance the, uh, the functionality of this, um, this uh, deep learning uh, stuff. Now this gave you the entire scope of the, the proposal. We have three elements. I mentioned that one is simulation, uh, this experimental, and also this added manufacturing. So we do this more iterative ways. And this is a three years project. Um, the, 
CTU part is mainly focused on this part here. I will be handling simulation and the design and machine learning part. And then the, the industrial side will be collaborated with uh, collaborated by with uh, the Prusa research. So this is all I have for today. And last one, I visited Jordan um, last December. So um, welcome, you have any questions? Like we are world travelers here, right? And then you get to learn about Prague. We actually, I do have a campus there. Uh, I interested in there. I think undergrads take some classes there. I think we teach statics. They cover statics, and Kevin, our faculty, he wanted to open its thermodynamics course, but I don't think he would get the students yeah, from so there. So it's for, yeah. not for graduates. Maybe someday. Are there any questions for Dr. Leon? Dr. First off, um, how much training data do you need in order to train these neural networks, given the number of design variables that you already have? The, the training data come from some sources, because uh, this group already working with a, a school in Slovenia. So they do have some existing data. But certainly those data would not be sufficient because they based on their very simple three-dimensional I mean, architectures. And we like to see if we can augment such data by our synthetical data. So our training data will be our finite data with some experimental data. And the, the, this group probably also will do some testing as well, too. Um, if you don't put the physics info into the training, it become unmanageable. Even with the physics info constraint in there, I think at least we need to have um, probably 10 different type of uh, topology to start out. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, so for any design problem, most of the time, at the end, you have to deal with kind of optimization of certain function, right? So that function can be your cost function, right? Usually, right, you use that trying to use like range multiplier, right, to add all this constraint in there. Similar in the machine learning too. So when you do the iterations, mathematically, you add additional constraint on top of that. So that constraint can be your governing equation, can be your energy conservation, something like that. So would be with okay. So good question in the way that when you look into um, this this um, machine learning, right? So I have a two part. On the right hand side, you can see that I put the constraint, right, mu less than zero as a constraint in the cost functions. But on top of that, more importantly, I changed the entire architectures. So I add another layer of this physics because I want to relay my three-dimensional architectures with respect to material mechanical properties. So this part here, I require some testing data, right, as a training too. Yes. Okay. We for this specific purpose, we don't intend to use X-ray. We use um, this high-speed camera. We have a two camera here, and then by using some X-ray data combined all together, we will be able to get the dis internal displacement as a function of time during that impact loading. Just say displacement in three dimensions. Is it just that, that you are feeding into the machine learning framework? 
Machine learning, we look into a little bit more global pictures, like uh, your stress strain curve, right? Your stiffness, strength, right? Also the entire, right? The area called the energy absorption. Those are the kind of three physical parameters we're trying to optimize. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, regarding about stiffness, we can start to train that because that's easier, right? And then that has, will not play an important role regarding about our final, uh, the energy absorptions. So we're going to kind of uh, focus at the beginning, look into the stiffness optimization and followed by strength, also the SEAs. We're going to have more like steps. Step, yeah, yeah look like steps. Yeah, not simultaneously optimize all three because that would be very over overwhelming. Yes, yes, yes. We have different weighting. Yes. Yeah. Yes, great question. Uh, we have not really sorted out that detail. There are several interactions. For example, if I put this module in, so this two, how do they interact? And then interact with the following generative module. So there are a lot of uh, alternative you can play around. Because uh, before, right, you only have this two module, right? Now you add this one here, right? How would this affect of this recognition by right, module versus others? So there are still a lot of detail. Um, I, I don't know I have an answer for that at this point. Um, in general, right, the deep learning we're dealing with now, we have many, many internal layers. Because my data set become, my, become very high dimensional. So we can have maybe over 10 internal layers, and each one may have 15 neurons. But if I don't put the physics in front there, I mean, it will be, it will be much, much more, which is, we cannot really handle that. Because your training process becomes very, very time consuming. But putting the physics info in there, you can speed up at least at least two order or magnitude out of that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good question. DVC, right now we only can do up to twenty meter per second dynamics which is already very, very high, 20 meter per second. One second you can deform, right? You can the velocity. Uh, so far, each cell, right? Each cell, oh, the three-dimensional one, so each cell is about 10 millimeter in one cell. So we are talking about 80 millimeter times 80 millimeter. You have impact, right? The heat again. So this probably will be 80 millimeter square in plane dimensions. Thickness depends. So if you really wanted to find out the properties, you need to have sufficient layers, 
right? Uh, I would say probably you need to have a, at least 10 layers. So you talk about eight by eight by 10. So you have a 640 unit cells, right, for that piece, which also would take a lot of time to make that, right, from your uh, Prusa 3D printer. This will be, you know, if so this will be inequality, right? We don't really put the constraint, you'll put the range. Say so that mu cannot be greater than zero, right? Now, as you know that if you really squeeze this material and they're all kind of collapsed, then the mu will not be negative anymore. Right? So there's other other issues. A mu less than zero is more from linear elastic sense, in a way. Right? I don't have any Answer, good answer for that, but this is plan we want to do. Yes? Uh, have you like, looked into or do you consider the incentive to uh, find different network architectures other than fully connected? My experience with machine learning is about four years. So we start from the regular, right? The, regular neural net, not, nothing special. So we'll graduate into physics in form. And in the past, we only constrained from the cost function point of view, right? Like mathematic cost function. Now we will be able to change the architecture. So this is probably the first try. We want to change the entire architecture to see that we can provide a much better training for that. I, if this, does this work? I don't know. But I think this is just a proposal we, we, we propose. Research. <laughs> All right, yeah. I think this is the most uh, rapid student in involvement I've seen in the seminar. So I was very thrilled to see you guys ask a lot of questions. So I'm guessing Dr. Yuan uh, raised a lot of thoughts in your mind, which is good. So hopefully, next, outside people, if you guys can impress like this, it will be great for our graduate program. So thank you again. Thanks for coming. And once again, let's thank Professor Yuan. Yeah, the pattern is very obvious that you can almost represent as decision tree. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. 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 you have to combine yeah. it. Yeah, you have to. You have to. Yeah. There are some ways. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You are an important man in in search community. Yeah, hopefully I don't mess up. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's good experience. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you're using, uh, I guess, for the, uh, the actual like uh, topology generation and things like that. You're using, I guess, uh, additive additive for that. Are you using uh, are you using uh, stereothermal for that, or are you using like a polychat potentially for that? Yeah. Not the robots, not that complicated. Yeah. Uh, basically, 
nothing but the best. Yeah. Right? And then we have a couple of them in our laboratory. Actually, you know, they improve some machine will cost like five hundred dollars. Yeah. Right? So basically it's just more like add on type of things. It's not like you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so, uh, um, are, are, is that like a is that like an extrusion based? Extrusion. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right, okay, cool. Also we look under UV too. Yeah, yeah, UV is like it's a, the the sizing is going to be a little bit too small, I imagine. For what you're you sounding like you had like eighty millimeters by eighty millimeters for you know, so yeah. I mean, We're trying to see what was the true star mm -hmm. because they are very commercialized. You know, you you, you need this company, right? Yeah, yeah. Boy. And most of my students they had this in their house, but they wanted to really apply into a real industry, like the automotive or real estate. Mm -hmm. So you have to scale, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's what you're saying that, you know, what kind of method, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But for the polymers, they don't really look into that high-end right, performance, mm -hmm. right? So that's why maybe we have some challenges, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 that'd be interesting. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so, like, so your, your set of polymers there would be this type of plastic. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's like, um, other things I was gonna, I was gonna potentially ask you would, would have been, like, if you're, if you're using multi-materials and stuff for that sort of unit cells and stuff. Multi-material, that's another thing. Because this is a poison ratio less than zero. Yeah, yeah. If we do, I have still want to do the negative thermal exchange coefficient. Mm, yeah. Then I need the multi material. Yeah. Can yeah. you do multi material? That's something we're going to try to do right now. It's like with, S with SLA stuff, that's almost uh, uh, that's almost a single material stuff. Yeah. So um, we're building a second system where we're going to try to incorporate a little bit of uh, a polyjet and then with SLA and things like that. So hopefully it'll be somewhat scalable. But like, but uh, right, right now we're, we're still in the planning stages of trying to make sure that uh, you know we can do that or not. So. Because as I said, we wanted to have a box, mm -hmm. put negative point ratio also in non-zero, mm -hmm. non core non less than zero. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, it's zero, right? To make it for the space applications. Yeah. yeah. But in order to do that negative or zero to make the we need a much material. Yeah, yeah. And we we don't want to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, like the best ways to get uh, multi-material stuff from what I've seen in literature and things like yeah. that is like the, you know the polyjet, you know, the polyjet, like, yeah, right? like that position. But the, the only problem is like if, like there's the you can go to camel and do stuff like that, but then you don't have control of materials and things like that. You don't you don't have the ability. You only have whatever they have, you know. So so yeah, I was thinking incorporating some of that into you know DLP in relation to that. I think would be interesting. So, no, so you, are you interested or you still thinking about it? No, no I'm interested. I'm, I placed an order for the polyjet deposition type of thing, so I'm committed to it. <laughs> You're committed to it? How, yeah. how, how much cost for this uh, polyjet? I was like, for, for, for a two material deposition, that was uh, about 30000 Okay. Yeah, so 15 per, yeah, yeah. per uh, deposition nozzle type of thing. So that's, so for things, that these are like, I guess, you know, your inkjet printer or whatever, so it's supposed to be like, you know, like 40 micron drops of, with like a, like, like three three sixty nozzles or something, I think it's one eighty nozzles. I think it took two. Oh. Yeah. So yeah, so it's like it can be, you can deposit one one pass through and then go like this. It can, it can be scalable that way. And then with the DLP portion of that, it's just trying to uh, incorporate some level of a gradient crossing potential within all that as well. So that, that was the thought with that. So um, we're still in the process of trying to gather things and still in the. Uh, kind of conceptual stage on trying to see which is the best, which is the best feasibility, I guess, for how to build it. Things. So, yeah. If you're interested in, because I have some idea, mm -hmm. you know, I can. I mean, as I said, this is certainly is the part of the two material actually. Yeah. I, I have some idea. We start from that two D. Yeah, yeah. We can make a lot of material and then we can test the thermal spin coefficients. Okay. Yeah. That type of things. Yeah. 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 I think yeah, that, that, that could be interesting. Yeah. Because never, uh, I never, I was thinking about multi-material, but no one turned to me or the one I mean, you can do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, other, other things we can potentially look at also with the, with the, with the standard SLA would be like a gradient cross-linking as well. So we can see what what one material can do within that realm potentially as well. So yeah, it's like so the the combined system is trying to combine two aspects of both of those because DLP now DLP is one, is more or less a one material system. But you can add like cross-link density and things with it, like a gradient, like you can change it. 
And then uh, with the with the ink, with the polyjet, that's something that's more scalable to be larger area and multi-material. So. so let me ask you one more question about the single material. Were you able to do called the functionally gradient? Functionally gradient. 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 Meaning that when you put that in there, the material property changes. If we need that. Yeah, yeah. You know, you have that unicef, right? So mm -hmm. unicef, I need to have vertical directions. Mm -hmm. So I know how to, right now, all the cells are the same, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. The impact coming in here, right? Mm -hmm. But I want to have a much strength mm -hmm. at the beginning when they got impact. Yeah, yeah. But now I want to design the material property which can be function of my thickness. Yeah. But potential, pot potentially you can. Um, mostly what I know of like the actual uh, cross line density variations, mostly from, from literature and things. And mostly, I'm mostly, uh, mostly used to like, you know, it's like it's either polymerized or because that's kind of my background. But uh, we, we have the ability to incorporate and try to examine you know, that, that effect of cross line density changes. And things. So, so yeah, you can, you, you can do stuff from the design standpoint, the overall ge geometric, but then we're also interested in looking at uh, cro uh, grading cross line density from the material. So now, do you have a correlation between your cross thing density versus your material properties? That's something we're going to try to explore. So we just got the uh, actual, our, our first custom DLP system. It's, it's really small, but it's high res. So um, that's the best trade-off of all this stuff. So we're, we're, uh, we, we just now got that more or less online and stuff like that. So we're going to try to look at uh, things like grayscale and things like that and for, for, for gradient effect on cross thing density. So from, from hopefully from that, sort of, from the beginning of uh, over the next uh, few weeks and stuff into next semester and stuff, we can show that, that effect. Thanks, there. You know, Harry, I, I have application in mind using, of course, AD, AD manufacturing. Yeah. And then you're doing polymers, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I have a lot of ideas, you know, but I just yeah. don't know how to, how, to, how to make that happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah the, yeah, the interesting thing with the topology optimization and things, you know, it's like they, they it's, it's about the, just the, uh, it's about the physical, I guess the geometric design, but then also so, sometimes they, uh, folks don't always take into account that uh, manufacturing process can also import their own things to uh, material things as well. So yeah. it's kind of where I'm coming at it. Yeah. Good. You, you make that happen. I only have ideas. Yeah. yeah. Good. Alright, so yeah, so yeah, so we're, we just now got the first system up and running and stuff, so I can uh, I can show you some some stuff uh, from uh, from what we can do and different things. Um, I know you're trying to do fairly large scale stuff, but this one it's 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 really small. So, oh, if, you're, small. so if you're looking at uh, uh, feature sizes in the hundred microns or, or smaller, that could potentially be an application for you on that. But then also the, the thing is, it's, it's uh, it, uh, the cross sectional area of this thing is going to be roughly. Uh, 1.2 inches by about 0.8 inches, so it's pretty. It's pretty small. Right? But it's just yeah. But just beginning. Yeah, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, yeah. The second system is about something we're going to try to see if feasibility of it can be something that can be scaled bigger. Okay, so. scale. I thought making it bigger or easier. No. Well, I mean, it's like trying to keep the 100 micron and smaller features. Yeah. That that ability. Yeah. yeah, yeah. For for this application. Uh, the cell size probably, if you can make 10 millimeter in one small cube, yeah. would be would be would be ideal. Okay. Yeah. To make it smaller, I thought manufacturing wise much harder. Uh, the, I mean, that's just one cell, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. thought it would be. I, don't, I do not know would it be some lot of defect if you make it into a hundred micron. Um. I was like with, with this one, it's all. Back, um, I know with the, with your with, with deposition things like that, like especially for thermoplastics and everything, you, you can the smallest you can kind of make is right around one twenty or so uh, microns or so. Uh, with, with the with the polymerization thing, it's more optics dependent and things like that. So if you have a really fine focus optics, usually the li the, the liquid in the in the resin container that actually acts as support and stuff as well. So you, so you can actually make things a little more free form with it. Yeah. Maybe we. If you have some preliminaries, say that I can I can visit your lab to see yeah. how we can kind of uh, work together. Yeah, yeah. Because I just said that I know the application. Mm -hmm. right? that, that, that's the typical example you want to pursue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. And then you can make a smaller size that's even better for us. 
Yeah, okay, okay. all right. Yeah, 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 there's always the size stuff. Because yeah, you can do high res, but you can't make it big, you know? That's, 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 the, that's the... We can make, we can start with a small, right? Even like uh, 20 millimeter, because uh, you know, my impact is based on your plate, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I thought UTDP won't have a bigger one. If you can make it small, we can start from small. Okay. But I need to have a little bit more repeated cell. Yeah, yeah. Right? So that I can get really real properties. Yeah, 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 that's, def that's definitely true. So what we can, I suppose like the, uh, the build area, I want to say it's about 1.2 by about 0.8, but then it's like that we can go, it's like it's, it's 50 millimeters tall or whatever, so we can we can build it this other direction and have that be more than that control direction. Make that a little bit bigger or whatever, so. Yeah, so there's a, there's a trade-off from all of that sort of stuff. So. All right. Okay, very good. Yeah. I think, uh, I want to say, Jay, Jay has a talk, I think, in uh, ED1, it's about right here over there. I think it's already talked, no?